Hi, my name is Salvatore Sorce. I'm one of the voice coaches here on the voice and accent team at the London School of English. Today, we're going to talk about the changes that happen between English and Italian or how Italian speakers want to learn to uh, make those changes in pronunciation to English. Before we start, let me be very, be very clear about something. I'm only showing you the differences. I'm not trying to say here what is right or what is wrong about any accent. I'm just showing you what is different. So many people do approach accent training as in, oh no, that's wrong. Um, I don't believe in that way of approaching things. I think it's important to acknowledge that the sounds you make are specific to your language and that the sounds that we make are specific to ours. Now, I am a native Italian. Well, my family is from Italy. Um, and so I do acknowledge the resonances that come from the pronunciation that you use in Italian. And we'll go through these in a moment. But um, I want to be very, very clear that what you can do, we can't. And also what we can do, you may have challenges with. And that's all this is. It's just an identifying, an identification of sounds, the differences between sounds and how we help you um, bridge that gap, shall we say. Okay? All right, so, so for, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about then is before we even start all this, we'll talk about the setting of the face, the setting of the muscles and the mouth, because that plays a very important part in pronunciation. We'll then go through the major consonant changes, and I think it's important to look at the major consonant changes as opposed to vowel changes, because the major consonant changes are things that we can really see because they are working with articulators, parts of the mouth that come together. When we're talking about vowels, we're literally talking about the shift or the wave that the tongue goes through in making certain vowel sounds. And because English can be quite a complicated, let's change that word, shall we? A challenging language as far as vo uh, vowels are concerned. We have 20. Um, I know most languages not, don't necessarily have 20, but the combinations that we have, whether they be short, whether they be long, whether they be diphthong, can be a little bit more challenging to assimilate in the mouth. That's why I'm working specifically with major consonant changes. Okay, so the things that we're going to look at today are the Italian R and the English R and the rules of the R in spoken English. The light L and the dark L and the differences that there are between those two. What happens when we may have a speaker who uses the voiceless th sound and the voiced th sound, what the changes can happen and what we need to do to make those changes clearer. Um, we'll look also at the T and the D changes that happen within Italian. And we'll also look at the Italian Z and the English Z because there's a very specific and unique difference between those two. Okay, so going right back to the beginning, we'll have a look at the Italian R versus the English R. Now, the Italian R is the most, I've just come back from Italy and I've just experience the beauty of the Italian R. It's a beautiful, rolling, sensuous sound. And it's used so beautifully within language. Um, my, forgive my Italian speaking, but I think it's important to give you an example. Um, sempre un altra cosa. So we're literally looking at how that R really does inform the quality of that word. Now, that's what we call a rolled R or a trilled R. With the English R, we have nothing like that at all. And that may be where there may, uh, you may be finding within, um, from an Italian coming to an English pronunciation, you may be finding that you're taking too long on a word and it doesn't necessarily need that long. So instead of the R, what you, you're doing with your Italian R is literally taking the tip of the tongue and flapping it against the, the roof of the mouth there. <laughs> English don't do that. The English just literally curl the tongue back and they, it, it works in two parts. The tip of the tongue literally curls and releases forward. I don't know if you can see that what's going on in my mouth, so I'll make it bigger. And then there's also another part where the lips actually work together. So, it's, so you're almost creating a w sound, but you're not it's the combination of these two things together that makes the R. So the, uh, the and then the, so the two together, r, r, r. You can see how that actually combines to make the English sound. 
Now, let's also be very, very clear. The English, uh, English pronunciation is based on what we call a non-rhotic uh, usage. So when we are using, so we look, look here at the rules of R. When we're using an R, if an R is in front of a vowel, we will pronounce it red, rat, rather. But if it's at the end of a word, or specifically after a vowel, we don't pronounce it. I just gave you a perfect example where we had one at the beginning and one at the end, but we didn't pronounce the one at the end. Rather. So, R at the beginning, but R uh at the end. So this becomes what we call potentially a schwa sound. So, or we amalgamate the final R sound into the previous vowel sound. For example, third, worse, car, door. Can you hear what's going on there? There's no door, there's nothing like that. There's no car, nothing like that. Or third, yeah, we don't pronounce that final R. So if you can bear that in mind when you're using, um, when you're looking at English, because unfortunately, just because it's written a certain way, it doesn't mean that we pronounce it that way. It's one of the joys of English. Um, let's look at the light L and the dark L. Now, Italians uh, most definitely use the light L. It's a very, very liquid L. Um, so I'm just trying to think of, um, um, well, in my own name, Salvatore. So, L. L, very, very light. The tip of the tongue goes from the behind the front uh, top teeth and just drops gracefully to the, uh, to the behind the bottom teeth. So L, L, L. That's all it is. That's all you know. But in English, we have the dark L as well, where the dark L comes at the end of a word or after a vowel sound. So I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment, but let's just have a look at how we make this dark L sound. I want you to think that you're saying the word sing, sing, and you'll feel the back of the tongue going towards the back of the mouth. Now, sing, now your tongue tip should be at, behind your lower front teeth. All I want you to do now is bring that tongue tip up behind your uh, front top teeth, but still keep the back of the tongue up against the back of the mouth like that. It's like creating a little hammock in the mouth. So it, we'll try it together and we'll go through a step process. So first I'm going to say sing and my tongue tip is behind my bottom front teeth. And then I'm going to say single. Can you see how my tongue tip has actually come up behind my front top teeth? It's a big difference. So single. Oh, oh, oh. And you only use that L sound at the end of a word or after a vowel sound. So for example, I'll give you, um, I'll give you a, um, the use of the light L, that primary front L. Light, languid, uh, list, lots, little. And the dark L or that final L sound, which will come in the words milk, tall, cold, chill, full. Can you see what happens there? Now, there is a rule that if you see a vowel sound after that final L position, it will change back into a light L. So instead of saying full, we put a Y on the end of that and it suddenly goes, turns into fully. So it completely loses that dark L sound. If that's too much to uh, take on right now, don't worry about it. Just don't do it. We'll come back to it another time. Okay. So, we've covered the R, we've covered the L. Let's look at what happens with the F sound, a sound that I know Italians don't necessarily have within their uh, pronunciation. The, um, the, the L, the TH, sorry, the TH is a, is a challenging sound for quite a few European countries because um, they're used to literally using the tip of the tongue throughout the whole mouth but, well, throughout the front part of the mouth, but not thinking of bringing it through the front teeth, as I just have. So it's very simple and it requires little effort. And I think this is probably one of the most important pieces of, of advice to remember with the, the, the TH sound is because a lot of people do put a lot of effort into it. And actually, that's a good rule for all of English. A lot of people think that you have to put an awful lot of effort into speaking English, and you don't. It should be effortless. When you're doing your practice, make sure that you're doing it correctly, 
specifically, but don't necessarily think that you have to put so much force and effort into it because it's just going to make it harder for you to assimilate the sounds. So, when we look at making the TH, this is what we call a fricative sound. Now, if you see any of the earlier videos that we've done, you'll see under the, the chapter of fricatives, this sound uh, is a dental fricative. This is where we place the tongue tip through the front teeth. So what's happening here is my tongue is um, coming through the front teeth, just the very front part of it. Yeah, it's nothing much, I'm not doing this. Yeah, that would look ridiculous, wouldn't it? So we're placing the tongue on top of the bottom teeth, okay? And then the top teeth come down on top of the tongue, on the top part of the tongue, but there's still a little space for air to flow through. That's why it's called a fricative. So the airflow can continuously go through creating friction. So, Again, I'm only resting my tongue on my bottom teeth. There is a slight space between the top teeth and the, top, the tip of the tongue. So all I'm doing is literally, lightly, lightly blowing air through the top, um, the top of the tongue. Be careful if you, one of the things that mistakes that can be made here is by pressing the tip of the tongue too strongly onto, sorry, the, t um, the top teeth too strongly on that front part of the tongue. So what you end up with is someone doing this. And that's not really fun. <laughs> it's actually gonna cause more tension. It doesn't need to be that strong. So just think, it's very light, it's very easy, it's very effortless. So, think things. Uh, I'm just trying to think of other words that are coming to my mind, but right now <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, so think things. Use, that, use those, uh, those fricative uh, THs, those voiceless. It has no sound to it, just through the fr first part of those words. Think things. Now, the other, um, because what will happen here is the Italian may change the T, H, into a T. Tink, tings. And whilst there's nothing wrong with that sound, if you want to be clear in an English sp uh, speaking environment, then you do need to be aware of what the difference is. Um, let's look at the voiced version, which is where we actually allow some voice to resonate through the tongue itself, uh, some sound to resonate through the tongue itself, and we're still doing exactly the same movement, but we're just doing it with sound. So instead of doing a sound, we're doing a th sound. Th. So we're, we're just enjoying a little bit more vibration and it's actually quite fun. So we'll use that in the word those, there, the, this, brothers. Be very, very careful because what Italians can do is because again, not understanding the th sound is they may change it to a D, a D. So um, just be mindful that you could be saying those things, the, as opposed to those, the, oh, things, sorry, that was a, t that was a voiceless t, uh, t, those things, the, the, excuse me. So let's just be very, very clear. The difference between a, a voiceless th is a th. Be careful not to turn it into a t. The difference between a voiced th is a th. Be careful not to turn it into a d. Which leads us on to talking about t and d interchangeably as a plosive consonant. Now that plosive is where we put two parts of the uh, two articulators together and we build up air pressure and we explode them slightly. So in this case we're using a t sound versus a d sound. In some areas of Italy, I'll be very very clear on that, some areas of Italy do change the t to a d, slight softening of the t. It's not as, um, it's not as, I was going to say clear, refined, specific is probably the word I'm looking for. So I want you to think in terms of when you are using um, t, uh, think of the word, uh, think of its use in um, a, a primary position, tall, Tom, as opposed to Tom. Yeah, 
it's only a slight softening with the t uh, with the t that the Italians do. It's only a slight d sound, but that can change the quality of the sound and thus mean that a listener it will say, "Hold on, what did you just say?" In he in their head, they're kind of processing what was that sound. Then they're realizing what that sound is, and by the time they've re-engaged back with you, what's happened is they've lost half of what you're, what you're trying to say as the rest of that sentence continues. So just be very, very mindful of that. Okay, so the T and D. T, T, T. That's voiceless. There is no voice in there. It's purely air. The D, D, D is actually allowing voice through the tongue in making the sound that way, d, d, t, t. It's the tip of the tongue working against the area just behind the top front teeth. It's an area called the alveolar ridge. If you go back to that previous video I mentioned about the consonants, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about there. So, t, 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 d, d, d. Be mindful, there is a very clear difference between the two of those. Now, generally, if we're looking at what Italians use as what we in English would probably say received pronunciation, um, but that's our standard, English received pronunciation, there is actually an Italian received pronunciation. And you'll hear this very, very much uh, spoken by uh, officials, government um, um, news readers, who really need clear articulation in their speech. And it's actually incredible to listen to because the clarity of consonants in, in their speech is amazing. Be very, very mindful that our own dialect, where we come from, can soften certain sounds and make them less distinct. So finally, let's look at the difference between the Italian Z and the English Z. Now, there is a slight difference. Um, the Z position is, comes from, um, it, the Z is made in exactly the same position as the S sound is. Now, with, uh, here, when we're making the S sound, there's a debate, <laughs> there is a debate on where the S sound should actually happen. Should it happen? Um, it happens primarily on the blade, just behind the tip of the tongue, this area of the blade. And it sh uh, most of the time, let me just, I'm not saying it should, but most of the time it is formed against the alveolar ridge. So it's s, s or z, z. Now, some people do alternate it and bring it down to the behind the bottom teeth, the tongue tip behind the bottom teeth. That's fine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to query that. What I am going to query is the quality of the strength of that Z, because that Z can be quite hard in Italian. So, for example, grazie, zio. So, what we do in Italian is actually almost create a D, Z together. Z, Z. Now, in English, we don't use that at all. It actually just comes purely as that fricative sound, zzz, zzz, zzz. So it's a continuous, almost massaging of the, the blade against the alveolar ridge, that position there. So just think, zzz, 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 zoo, lose, rose, design. So that S quality, absolutely continuous through into the Z. Okay, so we've covered today the major consonant changes, the Italian R versus the English R and the rules of the R. We've spoken about the light R, light L, excuse me, and the dark L, which is used primarily in English. Pronunciation, excuse me. We've spoken about the voiceless TH and the, the, the potential to turn it into a T. We've spoken about the voiced TH and the potential to turn it into a D. So please be aware of those. Uh, we've spoken about the T and D changes. So again, be aware of what you're doing and, and how you're using it. And also the Italian Z and the English Z. And how the English Z is a lot more smooth, uh, a lot smoother, a lot simpler, less force in the attack. Please remember that whenever you're using the, any of these sounds, just use them with less effort. I'm not suggesting that you be lazy, but be specific, but don't work yourself too hard because it will just create more tension for you. If you want to see more of the work that we do, please come back to the London School of English website and to see more videos. Thank you.